I'm Alex Owana with Vintage King, and uh, this is the new Custom Series 75. The person I want to introduce to you is Bruce McBean. He's uh, the uh, lead engineer and lead designer with a team of guys. Uh, they put this thing together. Bruce has a really interesting history, and I think it's Bruce's history of working with a lot of different consoles as a tech and picking the best ideas from a lot of different designs over the, the last 20, 30 years that has been distilled into, the, into this thing. And uh, take it away. I'll start by passing this around. This is, the, as I said, this is the prototype console. There are actually at the moment only 33 channels in existence. That's the, that's the 33rd one. Um, this is prototype, so you'll see little parts stuck on the back and little wire links and things like that. Obviously, again, that's all sort of production. The reason I'm going to pass this around is so you can have a bit of a look at it. I've been having a little bit of a look initially at the, some of the chat forums and things like that, and there was a lot of talk on that about what this console is or isn't, and what's in it and what isn't in it, and has it got real, real preamps, you know, with transformers and inductors in the equalizer and things like that. I'll pass it around so you can have a look for yourself. Thank you. Okay, so the brief for this console when we started to design it was to capture the sound of the old MEV consoles from the 1970s. Who's used a console like that? Most people? Okay, what's the number one thing about those? Well, no, why would, why would you want to use them? The sound. That, would that be? Yeah. Yes. The two words that sum it up? The sound. The sound. Mm -hmm. Okay. You probably also know that those things were fairly expensive in their day, and even parts with modules ripped out of them are very expensive these days. They're quite, the way they were put together was very expensive to manufacture. So what we've attempted to do with this console is to use the old analog circuits, which are transistorized, um, and package them in such a way that the, the product is affordable. Who's ever pulled apart a Neve? preamp and equalizer and have a look inside it. You've seen the big attenuators, the rotary attenuators. This channel is based on a 1081 module. It's a four band EQ, the same EQ as a 1081. The mic preamp is nearly identical to a 1081. If you've seen the attenuator in a 1081, the bare switch costs nearly $150. And there's about a day's labor to fit the resistors and put all the wire into it. So you're talking about cost price, about $500 for that little assembly. What we've done in this one is we've used a $5 switch and some relays, which cost about six bucks in total. So we've saved $490 and given the exact same functionality and the exact same sonics. That's how we're able to implement this console at a reasonable price. We've done that throughout. Um, some people will say, well, is a relay different to a switch? Just a contact, it's sonically the same. Okay. A few other things we've attempted to implement, or have implemented, not attempted to, we've actually done it and succeeded. The old school 1970s Neve consoles, apart from the transistorized circuitry, which is different to what's found in most equipment these days, which use operational amplifiers throughout, um, the other difference is the actual mix buses themselves in the old consoles. They use what's called voltage summing. And um, each signal, each channel would feed onto the mix bus via a mix feed resistor. And the mix bus would have a level on it down around minus 30 dBU. And the impedance of the bus would be several hundred ohms. So it was a microphone type signal. And the amplifiers that were used to boost that were a variation on the theme of a mic amp with about 30 dB of gain. They actually used a mic transformer, the same transformer in fact as what's in that channel module for the mic input, and a two stage amplifier. Um, the sonic imprint of that mix bus is different to what you find in all more modern analog consoles, which use what's called virtual earth mixing or current summing. Uh, current summing mix buses, well implemented, have basically no sonic imprint. Has anyone used an SSL 9K? If you have, basically what goes in comes out. Okay? You've got the EQ and the compressor switched out, it's transparent. That's a very well implemented modern current summing mix bus. So you've got two types of technology. You've got the old school technology with a bit of flavour and warmth in the mix buses, and you've got this more modern circuitry which is 
transparent. Sometimes you like one, sometimes you like the other. Is that a fair enough comment? Okay. In this console, we've put both. For the stereo mix, there are voltage summing mix buses and current summing mix buses. Each channel can route its signal, post the pan pot, to one or the other. Two sets of mix buses, and then two sets of mix amplifiers, of course, and after the amps, the signals are combined. So you can route all the channels to the voltage summing mix bus, which we call the retro bus on this. There's a little button here called retro on each channel. That routes that channel onto the voltage summing mix buses, and you get the old school Neve sound. You can route them to the modern mix bus, and you get basically sonic transparency. Okay? Um, and there's a button you can route all of them one way or another, or you can just individually on the channels do sum and sum, depending on what you actually want to achieve. Um, because if you solo a channel, you want to hear it with the same sonic sound as, uh, as that what's going on to the mix bus, we have replicated the AFL buses, which is stereo. So there's actually four stereo mix buses, left, right, modern, left, right, retro, and four AFL buses, the same. So when you solo a channel, the, uh, the circuitry in the, in the console looks up which bus it's routing to, and routes to the corresponding AFL bus, so you get the same sonic character on your solos. The console is an inline console, so there's, uh, which is a bit different to the old Neve consoles. There's also a monitor path. Now that's implemented with op amps. Is anyone here into hi-fi? Hmm? That's odd. What do you mean hi-fi? <laughs> In theory, that's what, that's what the end result of all the music that we record is for. Um, I just want to say a little bit about the circuitry using the channel path in that is basically a 1081. I'll come back to that in a moment, but it's transistorized circuitry. It runs off a single power supply rail, just like the old stuff. There's a lot of other circuitry to make a mixing console. You've got to have auxiliary sends, you've got to have a monitor section. Here we've got a mix B or monitor mix, whatever you want to call it, second path through the channel. We've implemented that with op amps. So we've implemented it with the very latest op amps from National Semiconductor. Part is called an LM4562. You won't find that, to my knowledge, at this stage in any other consoles. You will find it in some very high-end outboard equipment. Because it's new, it's a bit more expensive. Um, but we figured it was worth the price to get the, to get the quality we want. The monitor section in particular has been implemented with these high-fidelity op amps because one thing with a lovely old warm nice Neve sound that you have is that's great for putting it onto your mix but you don't want your control room monitor to give you a flattering sound. The example I've mentioned a couple of times is you play an external CD input through an old Neve console it's going to sound fantastic just going through the control room monitor because it's going through the same circuitry that imparts that warm sound. For the control room monitor you want accuracy so we've implemented that it's a, the, the, the control room monitor is you can hear it go and click there. It's a relay attenuator and it's implemented with high fidelity op amps. Alright, so back to the channel path. As I mentioned a couple of times, it's more or less a 1081. There's a micro-amp, a four-band equaliser and a line output amp on the end of it. Now one difference we've done, for those of you that know your old new stuff, you'll know a 1081 has a class AB output amp, which is not, which is good, but it's not the most desirable thing that you've ever done. Many people prefer the sound of their Class A line amps, which predate that, that particular, the 1081, by a few years. So what we've done is we've actually implemented the 1081 mic pre and 4-band EQ, but we've put a Class A line amp on the back of it. So it's sort of like the best of everything. <laughs> That's the idea. Um, when you're tracking these days, very often rather than tracking through the mix buses, you'll actually track through the direct output. If you're recording a single microphone, you want to come direct out. You may want that nice, fat, warm sound that that Class A line out gives you, or you may not. If you don't want that, you come out the direct out, which is before the transformer. So again, just like the mix buses, you've got some choices in the sound. The whole idea of this was to give a bit of flexibility in a range of different sonic characters that you can impart onto the, the sound or music that you're recording. A little bit more about the technology we've used in the console. The circuitry, as I said, the, the, uh, the channel path is primarily, in fact the main channel path 
when the insert's not switched in, is all transistorized, just like the original stuff. 100% uh, when the insert, the insert itself is electronically balanced, send and return, but if the insert's bypassed, it's by, hard bypassed by a relay, and you're talking all transistorized circuitry right through. Um, I mentioned we use relays to switch, like to step the gain and things like that. This, uh, the relays in the, in the channel are actually controlled by a microprocessor. So we've got very old school audio circuitry with very modern control. There's actually a microprocessor in each channel. So when you press a button or rotate a control, the microprocessor reads that and then turns on the appropriate relays to implement the function in the audio. That means we don't have to run wires up to the front panel controls. We can keep the relay switch in the audio down on the channel where, where the audio belongs. The other advantage that gives us, which assists again with manufacturing the console for an affordable price, because all the switching is under processor control, we've got an audio precision and we use visual basic macros to do automated testing of the channel. So it can, the, under serial command, the channel can turn to the mic input, set the gain to a certain amount, turn the high pass filter on, and we can feed a signal through it and look for noise and distortion on the output all automatically and have, instead of having someone sitting there having to step all the gain positions and things like that. <coughs> My background is I'm an electronics technician. I've been a studio tech, I'm 50 years old now, I've been a studio tech since I was about 25. So I've seen a lot of other manufacturers' products, some of which are very good, some of which, mm, maybe not so good. The one thing that I agreed with my boss when we did this, that we want to make this serviceable and last for a long time. We want to design it so that it's easy to fix and able to be fixed for, you know, for the duration. And we've put a lot of thought and care into making th you know, things that I've seen in other products that have been weaknesses. We've put a lot of care into it to make sure it doesn't happen on this. For example, if you were to have a look at this end on, you'll see the front panel is not a piece of folded metal like on many consoles. It's actually an extrusion, an aluminum extrusion. And the centre ribbon that's quite thick, that is never ever going to bubble. Um, other little things, all of these rotary controls here are supported on brackets, so that if you wiggle it, the force is not applied to the solid connection on the printed circuit board. The force is spread by the bracket. So after a while, with a lot of you who's experienced that, you know, you've got a control that cuts in and out. That's because the force of the control is applied to the solder connection and eventually it fails. You can fix it by redoing, you know, touching up the solder with a soldering line. Um, but by putting the brackets on, it means we've forestalled that. And there's a lot of other little things like that that we've put into the console that will make it serviceable for many years. One other little thing also to make the product have a long life. The press buttons, you've probably seen some products with press buttons where the writing is printed onto it and what happens after 6 to 12 months? The writing rubs off. All of these press buttons are engraved, okay, with a CNC engraver, so the writing will not rub off. Likewise the printing on the front panel, the panels are actually anodized with the blue colour and all of the text and graphics you see is actually laser etched, so it doesn't rub off. <coughs> 